you. <laughs> all right, great. All right, so we're going to ask, a, we've got one or two general questions for the two of you, um, and feel free to, you know, just both um, of you, you know, answer that. Um, so I guess one of the things I'm wondering, sort of probably more based on, on what Jen was saying, but also thinking about the DACA and the implications of the parents still working with the youth as they enter into university, what do you think, above and beyond what Jen told us, what do Latino parents want educators to know? I mean, I know that that sounds really as if you're going to stereotype, but there are a couple of things that I'm sure you could just say these are things they want us to know. One of the things uh, is that um, they they don't want to be notified just for the bad things that happen. That uh, a lot of those parents said, you know, teachers only call me when there's something wrong. And when I went into teaching, um, I had that with me, which was great. I mean, I knew that, but I also had data to back me up. Uh, and I remember calling home and I would call, I remember calling one parent's, one student's home and the mom answered and I said, hi, this is Dr. Matos calling from such and such school. I'd like to talk to you about so-and-so and he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me get his father. Hold on, hold on. And <laughs> my dad came in and I could hear the family gathering and they were ready for bad news. And they said, what did he do? What, what happened? And I said, Oh, I wanted you to know that he had an A on his last assignment, and he did great, and it's a pleasure having him. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, well, if you need anything else, you call me back, okay? And then, you know, th that's what happened. But, you know, I and I say as, as a parent of a five-year-old who I adore, I send her to school every day, and she's the most precious person to me. And so that's how these parents send their children to those schools, that these are their precious people. And, of course, they don't want to hear only bad news. They're, you know, they want to know that we love their children and they love their children and there's good and there's good surprises. And so that's, that's one of the things. The other thing is that they want to be involved. Um, they, they want to know what they can do. They want to know how they can help. And they want teachers to know that just because they can't show up to the PTA meeting that's awkwardly timed, it doesn't mean to count them out and they're not invested. So they want to know how they can help and they want to make contributions. Um, and they're excited about what's going on in, in the classroom. I would like to see more and more teachers provide um, some context for parents about what's being talked about in the classroom so they could if they follow up with that at home. And that way they have a, kind of a, a, a peek into what's going on in that classroom as well. So that's not this mystery that, you know, that where they're sending their kids up every day, that, that they have um, some information about what's happening too. Because they, they care and they're invested. Great, and actually that leads us uh, into the January the 7th, uh, the village. We actually have um, a couple of people sharing apps that can actually do exactly that, Jen, so to provide a very easy to access a cell phone package or, or particular app that really just engages with parents around good, bad, and ugly and um, draws them in sort of on a daily basis without it being like, I have to go and open up my email and read my email now and, and that kind of thing. Great. Lena, did you want to add something to that? Um, I think I want to echo what Jen said. I think that it's true that, you know, teachers could be communicating to parents what their kids are doing well. Of course, we all want to hear when we're, when we're doing well, not just when we need to, you know, be, make improvements. Um, I think for undocumented parents, given the current policy climate, I think that they want to know that the schools have them and their children's back right, that the schools are a place of safety and sanctuary, um, because I think that is a significant barrier right now uh, for undocumented parents. I know that in Massachusetts, it might be a, a much more welcoming, friendly place. The parents that I, um, of the kids that I got to know in Atlanta, which has been in the New York Times recently as one of the most hostile places in terms of ICE, you know, sort of making these um, stops and so I think that it's it's really that schools and, and teachers can send messages particularly for let for Latino or for undocumented parents that the school is a safe place it's a safe place for their children to be and a safe place for them to come to because I think that could be one sort of barrier to parental participation in this current policy climate right so what are the ways that schools can um, project that sending home letters um, making phone calls, reassuring parents that the school is a safe place both for their children and for them to be. And so I, I think it would be important actually for all educators to go and find out what their school policy is and find out what the district is doing um, so that you can actually pass on that kind of a message. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we have a question from the audience um, that is that has to do with this family engagement aspect, um, but specifically for high school teachers who are helping through the process of applying to college. Um, what should teachers have in mind if they're dealing with their Latinx students um, who are trying to pursue higher education? I think especially the undocumented worker, the undocumented mm -hmm. students too. Um, mm -hmm. Separate different route for that. Is this sort of does one get legally involved? How does that work? So this is where looking at individual state laws really matter, right? So um, there are currently 16 states that offer in-state residency tuition. Uh, and Massachusetts, as I noted, offers, I think, in-state residency tuition through students who have DACA. So um, I think, first of all, being aware of your state's policy, right? So what is the state policy? And if there is no policy, then it's kind of de facto students are probably applying to public colleges and universities in the state as out-of-state residents. Um, and then the next layer is to know about uh, financial aid. And undocumented students are not eligible for any form of federal financial aid, so they won't necessarily need to fill out things like the FAFSA. Um, but in different states, again, it varies that there might be state aid, and for many of those states, there would be a different application that students are is more undocumented student and parent friendly. So I think part of it is just getting to know what are the state policies um, and, and then kind of going from there. And there's several scholarships and um, other programs available for undocumented students, and, and I know that it's, it's always a, a to keep track of so many students can be hard, but I think um, United We Dream is an organization that usually has very up-to-date information about local state policies um, and, and ways to kind of gather that information and pass it along to your students. Great, and I have, um, I teach in Springfield, Massachusetts, which has a very high percentage of um, Latino mm -hmm. students, so I, um, Basically, what can I do like tomorrow? What can I do right now to help support these students and get them engaged in um, the school community, the shared school community that we have? So, um, I, I guess I think in part you can, you know, um, there's ways to indicate, I have a sign in my window right now and it says, I'm, um, what does it say? I'm an unafraid educator working with and for undocumented students. So I think, you can get you can print that from united we dream and i think that's something you could put up in your office or in your classroom that would signal to students that this teacher is is aware that this is an issue and it might be someone that i can share my status with so in california students are very comfortable sharing their legal status in high school with people who can help them navigate the college process in georgia many students did not share their legal status with anybody in their high school and they were just adrift on their own. Um, so I think that they, if they had had teachers that were kind of make, putting it out there that, you know, I'm aware of what this issue is, I'm an ally, an ally educator, that that would have opened the door for them and it could have vastly changed their trajectory from high school to college. Great, thank you. Jay? One of the things that, I mean, communities like Springfield and Holyoke, one of the things, uh, or communities with high Puerto Rican populations, one of the things that's on my mind as a Puerto Rican educator is what's happening in Puerto Rico. So I think that as, as things, you know, we have real life things in the, in the world happening, uh, when we pretend there's nothing happening in Puerto Rico, or things are business as usual, I think that's hurtful to our students. Who have people on the island who they care about, who know, who might have visited as, as children, who might have family there, who know what's going on, who know what the island looks like, and who are bothered by it. I don't know a Puerto Rican person in the United States right now who's not affected by this, by what's happening in Puerto Rico. So I think educating all of our students on this and, and say, showing that we care, asking our students, you know, how's your family? Is there anything I could do? Like real life connections, I think, is, is one thing. The other thing I think is, um, is culturally responsive teaching. Is the other thing we could you know, culturally responsive teaching isn't you know a situ isn't something where we have to shut everything down and say okay now we're going to be culturally responsive right it's it should be in the fabric of what we do every single day and so if we're not doing it yet then we start that tomorrow you know and it doesn't take any any huge effort to start um, bringing that into our classrooms 
who's on the walls, who's represented, how do students see themselves in the curriculum, how do we show up, how do their stories show up, um, how do we invite those in, uh, how do we use those forms of cultural capital, right? Easy as noticing a student's strengths and saying, hey, you know what, you're really good at storytelling, why don't you do this or that? Um, and inviting them in, how can they be a part of the curriculum in a way that's meaningful and it's not just um, lip service. And so I think that's something that right tomorrow morning before the bell rings, you know, um, thinking about how you can incorporate that into um, the life of your classroom. How can you invite Latino parents in to showcase their knowledge and, and not make this assumption that there's nothing there? Um, because these are communities rich with resources and rich with knowledge, funds of knowledge as we call them. So how do we invite those voices in? Whose voices are missing and how can we bring those in? Great, and actually I'm um, talking about that, Jane. We actually have one of our MAT alumni, uh, Bevan Brunel, who teaches in Polio. And um, Sarah Frenette from our undergrad department actually helped her gather resources and supplies for her classroom. And during the next week, we're going to do some more um, outreach to people. Um, she's quite a few students that will be coming to her classroom and they've started coming in and they're looking for something, some simple supplies like paper, pens, three ring binders, etc. So we will be putting a call out for that. Um, so in order to just help the students be able to um, sort of be with the rest of the students and have what the rest of the students have. Mm -hmm. um, I think Lauren has got someone. Well, we would like to ask Gail, if you could unmute yourself, turn your video on and pose your question to our panelists. Thanks, Gail. Sure. It still says um, the hostess has stopped me. Okay, now I have access. Start my video. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, it's really awesome to partake in this discussion. Um, I am currently teaching at Achievement First North Brooklyn Prep um, in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Um, and but my school is predominantly Latino. Um, I think a Latinx, I'm now getting accustomed to this, um, this term and I'm happy to start using it in my vocabulary. It makes sense. Um, so I teach first grade and my question is, should we be attaining that status as early as elementary school so that we can better support students because with my understanding is that it's it's easier to um, like it's easier to complete or move towards the immigration progress the earlier the child is the easier it is but I guess that also depends on the legal status of the parents as well but I can say for like as a first generation person and my mom having the support um, of you know the support of family and people to like move that process ahead and i have other family members that have not that are very very close to me um and their access to go to school and so on was impeded or the type of jobs that they can have so that issue is very sensitive and near and dear to my heart so um i'm happy that in light of the mission statement being to get these students to college and preparing them for that if if the immigration status isn't on the forefront or in our minds, or we're not even like helping in any way towards that, um, then you couldn't fulfill that mission. So my question, I'm not sure if I made it clear already, but do you think that that needs to be a part of like the, in the application? Um, uh, do you think that or do you think it's like a less informal conversation that you have with parents or with your school to create an environment where people are safe and you're working to be like an advocate for that process? I think that's a great question. So, you know, first graders are young um, and they what the research tells us is that undocumented youth who I often talk to when they're much older um, are aware uh, that they might be undocumented or that their parents are undocumented, but it doesn't become um, as meaningful for the college going trajectory till they're in high school. It doesn't mean that they don't have these experiences that I think uh, highlight 
the vulnerability of being undocumented in this country. Um, so I think, again, I, I think the one solution or one recommendation is to think about how can the school create a culture of welcoming for undocumented families, right? Um, with while still letting parents and children negotiate how they have that conversation of talking about what it means to be undocumented. Often many of the young people that I spoke with when they were little, like in first grade, their parents were very explicit. They had stories about you know, where they came from. Say that you were born in Texas, one of my respondents shared, because there is an, an understanding of the vulnerability of, of what it means to be undocumented in this country. Um, so I think it is more a school level, classroom culture, teacher culture um, approach to create a welcoming environment to, to open the door to letting those conversations happen um, is really, I think, what I would imagine the elementary school context might be like. Jen, I don't know if you want to add to that. What, you know, I think as teachers, um, we, treat, we treat our students as like precious to us. So it doesn't matter, it should not matter to us what their legal status is. It should, just like it shouldn't matter to us what color eyes they have, where their parents came from. We teach each and every student with the same passion and vigor uh, and care that we teach every other student with. And I think as teachers, if we demonstrate that, that, you know, I, I care about you, um, I think that that does a lot, especially for a first grader, you know, thinking about what they might be afraid of. Mm -hmm. First grader, like uh, children's fears are, are huge. You know, um, if, you know, my, I know um, of someone the day after the election, they, that their children cried because um, they thought their dad was going to get taken away. Mm -hmm. These are real fears. And so going to school with these fears, how can teachers help students with that instead of adding on to it? Let them know that in this classroom you belong. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that question, Gail. We're going to take it to Lauren for our next question. So my question is from Nicole in the audience. And um, the question is for Ed Edelina. Um, and she says, regarding the students who went into college as DACA students, um, what are some of the resources available to them on their campuses? And are there any suggestions you would give of programming that would be the most supportive for them? So, um, I, again, institutions like states vary in terms of the resources that they offer um, undocumented college students. So in California, there's undocumented student services centers and on the nine University of California campuses, a person dedicated to working with undocumented students to help them navigate college, but that is kind of a more unique situation. Um, and I, so I think uh, what, what colleges can be doing is training their staff that work with undocumented students, so staff in the financial aid office, um, staff in the registrars, uh, people working in the career centers, um, that sort of anybody that has interactions with students in general, um, making sure that there's at least one person who is up to date with what are some, what are the policies, you know, what does DACA mean, what does the announcement of DACA ending mean for undocumented students, um, and people who can provide advice that is, and guidance that is unique to the undocumented student experience. And so I think that that, that is an ideal situation, but that often doesn't happen. Um, so I actually, you know, challenge faculty to become, to know more about undocumented students as faculty members. We are also interacting with undocumented students. It's also our responsibility to create classrooms of caring, spaces of caring, and to help undocumented students know that they belong. Um, so I think many of the practices that we see uh, that are successful um, in K-12 should also be carried over to college to ensure that not only undocumented students, but first generation students, students of color, um, are validated and told that they belong. Um, so I think that, that that's something that also needs to be happening in the college level. Great, um, thank you so much. Um, you know, Jen, um, I heard you say a lot, make the students feel like they belong. And um, if you go back and watch Sonia Nieto's session that we did with her on culturally responsive teaching, 
you started with just something as simple as knowing how to say everybody's name. And, um, and then she gave a couple of other ideas as well. So could both of you just elaborate a little bit more? I mean, I think, um, you know, just some very concrete things that go along the lines of, and I think you both have actually included a lot of things, you know, sort of resources, how we can be more informed, how we can put up, you know, some stuff in our room, like signs, etc. that just show that we are a safe space, um, sort of to gently get that message out or get the message out quickly so that children feel that they have spaces to go to. But um, do you have any other ideas that you could just um, share with educators um, for tomorrow. I know that one of the things Sonia said was make sure that everyone is visible in your curriculum. Okay. So often we teach from either a script or we teach from a particular text that was written by a particular group of people and it doesn't necessarily reflect everyone's experiences and how do we bring everyone's experiences and their knowledge into our works. So I don't know if you two could just expand on that just a little bit for us. Please. Names are huge. Um, my name, my last name is Matos. For the first 13 years of my education, I was called Matos. And someone else had to teach me not how you pronounce my name. I was being called by the wrong name for the first 13 years of my education. And that's painful to me to think about it now. Um, because the, the other people named me, right? And, and instead of taking the time, I take the time to learn other names. Um, and I and I will rake myself over the coals to learn names to pronounce them correctly. And I'll often get students say, uh, I'll say, what do you want to be called? Oh, it doesn't matter. And I say, no, what matters? It's your name. I had a student. Her name is I'm Amanides. And she goes, well, call me Amy. No one gets it right. And I'm like, no, I'm going to get it. You're Amanides. That's who you are. And that's you. You're only defer, you know deferring because you no one takes the time. So I think that's huge. I knew a teacher um, who. Um, learned where each student came from at each country and had their flag represented in her classroom. And I said, well, what happens when you get new students? She said, I get new flags. And so it was just, that's just the way it was. I will hand out information sheets. I'll ask students for like their favorite songs and their favorite movies. That way I can reference those things in my classroom. And I have sat down and watched their, <laughs> I'm not saying they're all quality, but I've watched everything and that way I can refer. And then, you know, in a, if, um, in an English lesson or, you know, when I'm de de um, de um, delivering some curriculum, I can refer to something and that student goes, hey, she knows what that is, right? We have to do extra. It's not, an, a teaching has to change. Our teaching can't be what it was even 10, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. It has to evolve. Our student population, the complexion is changing. We have to change with it. And so I think with that, there has to be extra, extra touches, those calls home, um, those asking about what families are like and sensitivity to that because not every family um, has had a good um, relationship with a teacher, right? Or, or a, a social worker or someone coming from the outside. So thinking about how we form those relationships and being really intentional about it. So we're not just going to show up and do home visits. It's not one of these movies where the teacher comes in and saves the day. That's, that's not real life. That's Hollywood. So thinking about what's it going to take and being really deliberate and intentional in, in creating relationships. I think that's, that's another thing. Um, and so it's going to take extra footwork from teachers to learn what's important to our students and how are we going to invite that in. And I hear a lot of teachers say, well, there's no time for that. Well, we have, you know, we have, <laughs> we have to make time for that. We have to think about how we can make time for that. And there are creative ways that we can do that and still, and still fit it into the curriculum. And pay, paying attention to what's happening, like again, what's happening in the world and how that affects our students. The day when, um, when uh, for Michael Brown, when the person who killed him was acquitted, I was sitting there with students of color. And I knew I couldn't just ignore that this, this young man was going to go um, without justice. And so I happened to be teaching Audre Lorde that day. And so I was able to, and I think as an English teacher, I have a lot of leverage uh, because there's a lot of different things I could talk about. But every single teacher, I think we have to all sit down and look at our curriculum and how can we, how can we incorporate diversity, inclusion, and social justice. Every single subject can include it. Biology, math, history, the arts, we can all do it. We just need to sit down and take some time and say, how can we do this without tokenizing any of our students as well.